introduce you to today's featured speaker. Jerry Zaltman is the Joseph C. Wilson Professor of Business Administration Emeritus at the Harvard Business School, where he was the co-director of Harvard Business School's Mind of the Market Laboratory and a co-founder of the research-based consulting firm Zaltman, Olson Zaltman Associates, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, Jerry has a PhD in sociology from the Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he is focused uh, on uh, customer behavior and marketing strategy, among many other topics. His best-selling book, How Consumers Think, has been translated into 20 languages. He's written several other books on uh, social change, research, and thinking. And his most recent book is Unlocked Keys to Improve Your Thinking. And he'll be sharing some of his ideas from that book in today's session. Jerry uh, is, uh, was received the Chef Foundation Gold Medal Award for Exceptional Contributions to Marketing Scholarship and numerous awards from the Association of Consumer Research, the Advertising Research Foundation, MIT, and the American Marketing Association's Charles Perlin Award for his lasting impact on the field of market research. So it's really a pleasure to have a good friend of MSI and, and a very interesting thinker, Jerry Zaltman, today to share his thoughts about what it means to have an open mind in marketing. Jerry? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, and welcome to everyone listening in. Uh, I'm looking forward to a very productive exchange of ideas and thoughts with you about uh, what I consider to be one of the most important topics in marketing and indeed beyond marketing today. My goal for this session is to encourage you to further reflect on your sense of what an open mind is, why it's important, and how to nurture it. My hope is that at the end of the session, you'll have at least one idea as a takeaway that you feel merits much more careful uh, reflection, maybe a familiar idea that you'd like to revisit. It may be an idea you hadn't really thought much about before. I want to add that our discussion of an open mind only encompasses its operations in marketing. It does not extend to other dom <laughs> domains such as policies and practices concerning, say, public education, climate, globalization, health care, matters of governance, and so forth. These issues, and there are many, many like them, can be highly relevant in specific marketing contexts, but they are not of primary concern for our session. What is of concern is how we, as marketing professionals, think. So uh, be careful. I don't want you drawing conclusions about your uh, openness of mind, its presence, or may maybe it's, it's in need of nur greater nurturing in other contexts. I'm, I'm only referring to marketing. My plan today is pretty much the following. I'll begin by sharing some observations about why an open mind matters so much in today's changing world. Uh, I will also be offering a very short uh, comment on the concept of mind. From there, we'll proceed to a discussion uh, or a review of seven elements that characterize an open mind. I will single out one of these to highlight in terms of its, some of its underlying dynamics. And I'll do that simply uh, to illustrate with that one instance how all of the elements share very deep grounding in the behavioral sciences. I will also be identifying several threats to each of these elements of an open mind and then uh, spend some time on a particular approach for addressing some of these threats. I also would like to invite you to share in the discussion session toward the end, important qualities of an open mind that you feel I've omitted. 
I think all of us would, would love to hear those and would also like to hear about any particular techniques you've found for acting on any of these elements. So let me continue. Why uh, does an open mind matter? And to begin with, um, I think successful marketing management involves two things. It involves envisioning improved relationships with key stakeholders, customers, of course, being prominent amongst them, and then bringing these relationships to reality. Your ability to envision better relationships, or what I think of as the right thing to do, and bring them to life through deploying various resources, which I think of as doing the right thing, requires an open mind. As a consequence, I think a, a fair argument could be made that an open mind is both your and your firm's most valuable asset. Now, this is easier urged or said than done, especially in today's world of disruption. We know that knowledge and technologies that emerge from it have ever shortening or decreasing half-lives. This in turn reduces the shelf life of marketing decisions about what the right thing to do is and how to do it right. But there's one constant in all of this, despite all of this change, and it's an invisible con uh, constant involving how we think. In a fluid, dynamic, competitive world of opportunity, there is an unconscious tendency to cling to established ways of thinking. We kind of ignore the fact that our accepted thinking processes have expiration dates too. And those uh, such as our decisions uh, that result from them uh, are, are getting shorter and shorter. There's one uh, comment that addresses this very nicely. And it's a slide, it's a quote from Robert Burton's book, A Skeptic's Guide to the Mind. In it, he says, our brains possess involuntary mechanisms that make unbiased thought impossible yet create the illusion that we are rational creatures capable of fully understanding the mind created by these very same mechanisms. The basic message here is that unconscious processes foster the conscious experience we understand how it is we think. And I th that's a, a very sobering uh, thought. It is likely, in my judgment, through my experience, that the more challenging marketplace disruptions are, the more we fall prey to the illusion or perhaps fallacy that we must also, therefore, be automatically processing and adapting our habits of mind or ways of thinking. But facing new facts does not automatically adjust <clears throat> or adapt how we think about them, especially when we need to act quickly. Now, <clears throat> the failure to examine how and adjust how we think is understandable. First of all, it's not clear what we should change to. That's a big issue. It's also risky, it's also costly, and there's no magic wand for doing so. But I think being alert to this problem, that we have the illusion that we're doing pretty well in how we think, um, is an important step toward uh, developing an open mind. 
Not taking that step leads to a closed mind. Uh, let me describe a closed mind and then I'm going to offer a placeholder uh, description of an open mind. A closed mind is confident in its operations. It's also inattentive to those operations that it's so confident about. It's satisfied with what those operations produce, our decisions. It suffers from what I call bias agnosia, which is an inability to recognize its deep-rooted biases. And a closed mind, of course, is something that other have, others have, not me. I'll note <clears throat> that a closed mind is also energy efficient, but it also fails faster. This is in contrast to a closed mind. And this is just a placeholder definition because we are short, very shortly going to have a more extended treatment of it. An open mind is eager to examine its own operations. It's comfortable making changes in how it acquires knowledge processes knowledge and puts knowledge to use. What we'll be seeing, or at least I hope we'll see and discuss if it's not evident, is that an open mind is not simply more or less of a closed mind. Just like um, having happiness replace sadness is not a matter of simply dialing up or down on the same dynamics. Uh, an open mind and a closed mind are intellectually and viscerally different kinds of experiences. Now, before we go further, um, I have a, a warm up question for you. And I'd like you to make note of your answer. We'll come back to it toward the end of, this, of the session. You're free to share it uh, with others in this uh, webinar, but I want to be sure that you make a note of it yourself. Um, I want you to choose between two statements, A and B. And I want you to choose the statement that most applies to you at work in your marketing, <clears throat> excuse me, in your marketing position. Statement A is, I really love being right. Statement B is, I really hate being wrong. Now, I, I know um, if you're like me, they both apply. But still, I want you to choose just one that most describes you. A, I really love being right. And B or B, I really hate being wrong. And if you will, I, you should also make a, a private note, personal note, which of those most applies to the folks that you work with most closely on, in your job. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there's one final comment um, that uh, I want to make <clears throat> about the mind. And a good launching point is this quote from Lisa Feldman Barrett, how emotions are made. I, I, Professor Barrett, I think is maybe the foremost thinker 
uh, one of the most thoughtful people in any event uh, <clears throat> regarding emotions. And here she's referring to the human brain as a master of deception. It creates experiences and directs actions with a magician's skill, never revealing how it does so, all the while giving us a false sense of confidence that its products, our day-to-day -day experiences, reveal its inner workings. This is very much in accordance with the quote I gave from uh, uh, Dr. Burton. The basic message here is simple. Our minds are too clever to be trusted. And that applies to the point I made earlier about having the illusion that when we encounter new facts, there's a tendency to think that we're adjusting how we think as opposed to what it is we think about. Now, the, the observation I want to make generally uh, and that this slide prompts is that nobody really knows this, what a mind is. Um, and, and I know what an open mind is, but it's not clear to me just what the mind is that's open, what, what that entity is. And this is something that is broadly shared in the mind sciences. So. Um, uh, it's an elusive, an elusive quality. Um, we intuitively, intuitively grasp that it's there. Uh, we, th there are thoughtful descriptions of what it is, but, th but there's a lot of dissatisfaction with those, each of those thoughtful uh, descriptions. Um, we know that the mind is not the possession solely of the individual, that our <clears throat> family, friends, co-workers, society, and culture have their handprints all over uh, our minds. We're not even... Uh, quite sure who has one. Does your organization have one in all likelihood? Does your department or work team have one in all likelihood, whatever it is? Um, do your pets have one? Probably. Uh, even your car, when it malfunctions and your computer uh, seems to have a mind. So let me just make that important qualification as we uh, go, th go through the rest of the discussion. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, think of an aha spa as a place where you can nourish, create, nourish, change, reshape, explore your thinking. It could be a physical space, it could be just a, a mental state, if you will, a brain state, um, but it, it's a, a, a moment or a moment that's created by some context that allows us to imagine and think. Um, I have a colleague, Manji Yadav, who thinks of uh, an aha spar is a thinking space where venturesome but practical ideas arise. And he calls this an expansive thinking space. This is the uh, domain, this is the residence of an open mind. And, and who are the residents of this aha spa, this open mind? Um, there are seven that I'm going to feature today. The first one I'll discuss in a somewhat more extended way. Uh, the last two, the error sensing and question sensing, I'm going to illustrate in some, in some detail. Uh, <clears throat> the important observation here is that they do not exist 
independently of one another. In fact, the, the proper functioning of any one of these elements requires the presence of the others and perhaps those that you would like to add that I haven't um, thought to include or, or, or know about. Um, I'm going to necessarily speak about these in isolation of one another, but that's not how they live. That's not how they work. One can't, again, function without, without the other. Now, some thought starters as we go through each of these. These are questions and issues that I, I'd like to see you um, entertaining. First of all, what's missing from the list? Which of these are most central to your work? What is your skill level with each element? Does your team have a healthy balance among them? Uh, is there a, a proper division of labor in terms of specialization or skill uh, within the team with regard to these elements? Importantly, what organizational practices impede or encourage specific elements? Uh, what about your external knowledge providers? How open are their minds and do they supplement those elements that uh, were, that might be least well developed so far in your own uh, uh, company. Do some qualities get in the way of one another? Um, how do you practice each of these qualities? And how do your your how does your answer to the question about feelings of being right versus wrong? affect how you engage with or experience these and other qualities. So let's move on now to the, f to the, the factor of wide cognitive peripheral vision. This is the ability to recognize relevant content in dissimilar fields. It involves having ready access to missing expertise through perhaps a network of people uh, in and out of your firm. Uh, it, <clears throat> it also requires having intrinsic interest in other fields, as well as the ability and willingness to use analogy and metaphor, as we'll see in, in just a moment. Um, What's the disciplinary, what are some of the disciplinary foundations for, uh, for this element? Well, first of all, wide cognitive peripheral vision can occur partly as a matter of luck. For instance, I <clears throat> learned recently about a group that developed a wearable technology that could monitor diabetes on a continuous basis and automatically inject insulin when needed. Despite the time, expense, and energy that this firm invested in the project, they were very late in learning that the FDA would require lengthy field tests before approving their going to market. Uh, and it turned out that the company just couldn't last, couldn't financially afford to last that long. Luckily, a staff member was familiar, for reasons unrelated to this, to this enterprise, um, with uh, the pet industry. And they quickly figured out that with some adaptations, the, this wearable technology could be ad adapted for diabetic cats and dogs. And then it took off in a very productive way. And of course, another lucky uh, fortuitous event uh, is the famous example of post-its, post-it notes. The inventor was trying to develop an adhesive, but ended up developing one that just would not work in the intended application. 
but he happened to notice others in the company using it on sheets as bookmarks. And there from uh, developing po uh, there developed post-it notes um, and their success is, is well known. Well, no. Another, Another inventor, inventor just, might just might not have noticed and been observant, observant of the less, less uses of the excuse that all the colleagues were making. Now, now um, um, such, such a high cognitive peripheral vision isn't, isn't us, us, uh, uh, something, something which line, lines, on. Not, it's not as dependable as the same scene. Um, um, the principal reason for that, for that is, in general, general we have we very, very limited attention, attention budgets. It was, it was an, an article, article in, in a publication last month coming out of, out of the Harvard University, University Education School, School on attention. attention. And it was found that, that they, 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 they reported, reported on yet another study. study. Jerry, um, excuse uh, yes, yes. Jerry, excuse me, this is Earl at uh, MSI. We're getting some uh, echo and feedback on your mic there. Right? It just began about 30 seconds ago. Okay. Um, um, let me adjust the, the microphone. Is that still happening? happening? Yes, unfortunately. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, let, me, let me try something else. Earl, does Earl, this still, still produce the echo? echo? Yes, unfortunately. Um, by that, I can't hear you. Can you hear us now? There's still a bit of an echo. Try, try again now. All right, do you hear this is help? No, we're still getting the feedback. Sure. I could try to go directly to the computer. That Maybe. sounds better, yes. It sounds better now? Yes, thank you. Okay. I was referring to, please interrupt again if that comes back. Um, I was referring to a, a study. Um, reported in, by the Harvard School of Education. And they were, um, it turns out that in the year 2000, a, a major study was done that found that the average attention span of adults was 12 seconds. Now, you may think that's high or low, but what was interesting is they found that in 2015, it had fallen to, with the replication of that study, it had fallen to eight seconds, uh, suggesting a general decline in our ability to notice things, uh, to be attentive. It also was pointed out that the average attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds. So that's a, a, our, our limited attention budgets is something to, um, to be concerned with. Um, I'd be concerned about, I think all of you are probably familiar with the example um, of uh, in which people are asked to count the number of passes people, passes of the basketball people uh, wearing uh, a white shirt or making to one another along with people with black shirts. And uh, this is the famous experiment in which a gorilla walks through the group, um, completely physically just passes through the group, actually stops in the middle and thumps its chest and continues on. And about half the people watching this video, counting, focusing their energy on counting passes uh, amongst the white shirt team, um, 
don't see the gorilla, despite its very uh, conspicuous um, presence. Um, so we're not nearly as attentive or observant uh, as we think we are, and consequently our peripheral vision in an intellectual sense is a lot narrower than we often think. Now, I want to get to the foundations for this important element of an open mind. Uh, a wide cognitive peripheral vision can be cultivated. Uh, <clears throat> former P&G CEO, A.G. Lafley, uh, urged people, hiring people with broad interests and cultural ideas in staffing project teams in a and entire departments with people having diverse backgrounds. And this is echoed by other people who have studied the efficacy of doing that. Uh, there's a, a very interesting book by David Epstein arguing that um, uh, generalists will, his book is titled Range, by the way, predicts that generalists will triumph in a specialized world. And a similar argument is made by Frank Nagel and just recently published our article in the uh, January issue of Strategic Management Journal, arguing that a jack of all trades is an extraordinarily valuable character to have around in the business context. Now, how does this work? And, and getting into a little more detail. Try to recall an occasion when a friend or a colleague was describing an experience, say about um, service in a restaurant. The odds are very high that their story brought to mind an experience of your own. It might have been one that occurred a long time ago and that you haven't really thought about since. Moreover, it may only vaguely resemble the one your friend is describing now. For whatever reasons, your past experience was noteworthy enough to have been automatically encoded in memory using a variety of retrieval tags. Uh, and you did so without any plan or intent or thought about recalling this event in the future. But still, it comes to mind at that moment when your friend is describing an experience. The reason for this is that there is an unconsciously perceived structural similarity between their experience and yours. Um, the retrieval tags uh, play a very interesting role in, <clears throat> in metaphor and in the wide cognitive peripheral peripheral vision. Memory alone, of course, doesn't really help us much, uh, except maybe during trivia night. It does not by itself establish wide cognitive peripheral vision. Another process is required that is central to imagination and to solving messy or real structured marketing problems. And that process involves uh, being able to represent one thing in terms of another. It requires being able to represent one retrieval tag for a memory to another retrieval tag for a different memory. The use of metaphor is the centerpiece for connecting these tabs of otherwise unrelated thoughts that we store in memory. It is how, for instance, a current marketing task like having to stimulate word of mouth communication for a newly launched product becomes connected to an experiment you encountered a few years ago in a sociological journal about overcoming barriers to intergroup communication. And there are many scientists who have uh, addressed this issue like Steven Pinker, Antonio Damasio, George Lakoff, Daniel Schachter, and so forth. Uh, 
I'm going to move on here as I realize time is slipping by quickly and I'm going to um, skip a short discussion of the opiate receptors in brain cells that compel us in effect to uh, be making these connections. Another element <clears throat> for having wide cognitive, oh, excuse me, for, for having um, uh, an open mind is embracing ignorance. Ignorance is necessary, absolutely necessary to imagine. It's where knowledge comes from, actually. It can't come from anywhere else. It provides the empty spaces for our imagination and creativity to fill in. It defines what it is we need to picture, the kind of thing we need to picture that isn't present in current thinking. In short, knowing what something is requires knowing what it is not. Ideally, <clears throat> we respond to ignorance by seeking a verifiable conjecture. Without ignorance, uh, we can't, without valuing ignorance, we can't move beyond that, beyond um, current knowledge. So what, what does ignorance entail? It means being comfortable with the fact that there may well exist knowledge you haven't discovered yet. It may consist of um, being comfortable knowing that you've accepted something is relevant when in fact it may not be. That something you believe is sound may be in fact in error. And importantly, it also involves um, a, a grasping of the fact that your truth tests, the criteria used for judging relevance and soundness may themselves need to be uh, um, re-examined. This is bracing ignorance is, is very important. In fact, an interesting question is, as important as it is, when was the last time you were in an authentic, sincere way commended for being ignorant? When was the last time you, in a sincere and appreciative way, commended a colleague for their ignorance on a topic and owning up to it? Another important element is what I call, <clears throat> what I think of as wisdom. There is an abundance of meaning attached to this term. Um, it's an attitude of uh, intellectual humility. It's finding strength in doubt. It's an acknowledgement, it involves acknowledging the short half-life of knowledge and uh, the short shelf life of, your of the validity of your decisions. It, it, it notes too, accepts the fact that uncertainty is unavoidable. In effect, it requires a Goldilocks balance between confident knowing and constructive doubting. Uh, I think a wise person always has a, a grain of salt available. I'm not referring to the person who's a yeah, but who's always dismissing things. Another important ingredient in an open mind, and I hope you're keeping kind of an internal score as to how well you do and don't do, um, <clears throat> how much attention you give or fail to give to these, to these elements. This dimension of absorbing uncertainty is an interesting one. It involves really not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. It means being comfortable with incomplete information, 
in the fact that outcomes may be unclear. It involves being able to ex willing to explore ideas into issues, not knowing exactly where they're going to lead, lead. There is an importance of a willingness to make leaps of faith. And in my experience, the more important a decision is, it tends to be that also the case that the bigger the leap of faith that's required. It most certainly involves using imagination to fill in the blanks of uncertainty. Um, <clears throat> accepting the cost of changing your mind and tolerating paradox. Curiosity involves the drive to reduce ambiguity and uncertainty. It may well be one of the most uh, studied of the open mind uh, dimensions. It, it encourages the use of thought experiments it focuses on asking why and how questions, along with what questions. And it's especially relevant for seeing anomalies as opportunities. Uh, that's very important. Often uh, we see anomalies being kicked out when in fact they should be embraced and interrogated rather thoroughly. Um, in this day and age of, of so-called p-hacking, we see anomalies um, being eliminated from data in order to, in effect, give them statistical, greater statistical significance. But curiosity is, is an, essential, an essential element. You have to know enough about something to realize there is more to learn. But we shouldn't be so confident um, that we know so much that we don't need to learn more. Moving on, and I'm very sensitive to the time constraints here, so I'll um, move a little more quickly. Um, question sensing. Oops. I'm going to elaborate on this item and the following one um, in a somewhat different way in a moment. Um, this involves determining what the core issue to be understood is. Do you really want to know just what uh, parents think of a particular cereal they, they give to their children? Or do you want to know the role of food in the various transitions that their young children go through? Um, it involves identifying relevant domains of knowledge. What do ethnomusicologists have to say about creating emotional advertising? Um, it involves asking which knowledge boundaries we need to extend with what questions and distinguishing between right and obvious questions. Uh, typically, that's a distinction between difficult and easy questions, uh, which is captured really by the next statement, uh, not letting the ease with which answers can be uh, addressed drive questions. The next item uh, is error sensing. <clears throat> uh, this involves surfacing and challenging assumptions, challenging the relevance and validity of facts, their sources, and especially the methods providing them. We are finding more and more that methods that are borrowed from other disciplines are not always applied following the best practices created or established in the disciplines that originated those methods, um, resulting in quite likely significant errors, identifying likely blind spots for uh, surprises and monitoring uh, threats that seem far off to see if they've moved more closely. There are a number of biases that we have, natural, automatic, unconscious biases that interfere with each of these uh, 
elements of an open mind. And I think most of you will be familiar with, with such issues as hindsight bias, the not invented here syndrome, law of the instrument, convenient light syndrome, confirmation bias, and so forth, that I'm going again in the interest of time to pass by this and perhaps come back to it as, as, as appropriate. What I want to get to is the topic of conducting pre-mortems as a way of, any, of um, practicing some of these elements of an open mind. This question was put to me recently by a help desk for a major software supplier. I'm not going to, to, to comment on who it was, but if I've received it, um, it's possible that in time, uh, at some point in time, you, you might have seen it as well. There, as I said, a couple of problems with this, but here's what I want to, to be able to, to illustrate. A pre-mortem is essentially an, an exploration of results before you have them. It, um, you can simulate those results. You can um, uh, ask managers to predict the results. Uh, and I recommend doing both of those. This particular format, a questionnaire, a survey format, is simply a placeholder. We could easily have re replaced um, a format for using any one of a number of biometrics, uh, reporting a field experiment, uh, a laboratory experiment, one-on-one uh, -on -one personal interviews. It really doesn't matter. This is just a, a, a generic um, stimulus. Uh, this approach builds on, and this is important, an important aspect of our ability to detect patterns. Um, and this is a well-documented, well-discussed, but there's an interesting feature about this ability to detect patterns in data. Again, regardless of what what form they take, what methodology was used to generate them. This special quality is that we are uniquely engineered to detect patterns, actively engage in pattern seeking, even when we know the data are fake, are false. The truth value uh, of finding uh, findings, the fact that they're simulated or, or forecasted or guessed at, uh, does not seem to interfere with our innate tendencies to make sense of things. Let's say this is, you know, a question uh, that you be wrestling with. And, and <clears throat> Earl, I'll try to wrap up uh, quickly here. Um, let's say that first of all, that A, B, and C are results. Let's ignore that the, are, are simulated results. Um, and you present this to a team of managers. Um, <clears throat> what if you had answer or response A was the modal, modal, um, modal response? What would you need to know? What other questions would you wish you had asked uh, to be comfortable with that finding? What if it was C was the result? This is probably where it's more, more compelling. What else would you, what would you need to ask? What question would you need to ask if um, that was the result? Again, ignore the, the, the dashes. Um, 
what assumptions are you making that make that implausible or highly likely? This is a way of detecting errors. Um, for instance, I would also, in this case, have people have manager A, I'm switching from findings to manager forecasts, manager A, B, and C. Let's say they're all members of the same team. One predicts what you see here, another predicts, again, B and, and C. You know, as a researcher or as another manager, you've got a problem on your hands, that they're unlikely, A is unlikely to accept uh, finding C if man, if that turns out to be the case. Um, what, what are the different assumptions? Are they in conflict? Uh, how would you test, how would you find which assumption uh, set or bases are, are in error? Uh, I would also ask managers to provide uh, a range of answers in which they think there's an 80% chance that that the findings, central tendency of the findings would be within this range. That suggests, you know, say a moderate comfort zone. B would have a, a fairly narrow comfort zone. There's a high likelihood that manager B uh, would be challenged. What do you know about his or her framework or mental model? Uh, this context, what assumptions, what, what other belief systems are operating to produce such a conflict, let's say with C. Um, you can also determine that if, if it was uh, manager A and the result was C, that the value of that information is quite substantial. There's a big discrepancy between expected and actual. Uh, if everyone had agreed on answer A, you have to ask whether it's even worth asking this question. It might be, but you have to at least ask the question. Um, There are other, other observations you can play with statistical significance, but the main thing is to make friends with two characters, uh, a clairvoyant who can see the future and um, can imagine what if the clairvoyant sees C as an outcome versus A as an outcome. How would you change your research? even the research question or the, even the research method. Uh, the wizard is someone who fixes problems. What's the problem that would have to be fixed in case C versus case A? And are we gathering the relevant information that would enable us to take those actions? Well, I'm going to stop here because I sense I'm running out of time. Um, and I would love to hear from others in the audience. Yes, thanks, Jerry. That's that's great. I wanted to mention to the audience that uh, Jerry has uh, graciously agreed to share uh, a version of these slides with the audience. You'll be receiving an email within a couple of days following up on the webinar. You'll be able to access those uh, 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 slides to see the more detail. Uh, we do have an interesting question, Jerry, and just enough time maybe for you to respond. Uh, Diptimon uh, sort of pointed out maybe um, an ambiguity, if you will, between the, uh, or a tension between curiosity as, as seeking to close ambiguity or resolve it and the need to be open to ambiguity. Those seem to sort of work at cross purposes or be in tension with each other as goals. And I just wondered if you would care to reflect on that. Uh, Keeping an open mind is one thing, but at some point you do want to resolve ambiguity and maybe make a decision. Right. So, yeah. Uh, um, I think that, and, and perhaps I made an error in how I um, sequence these. I, I, <clears throat> and that could be what, what leads to the question. Um, 
when I say be comfortable with ambiguity, I mean um, see it as a friend, <laughs> see it as, as a positive thing. There is ambiguity. Don't deny it. Don't uh, minimize it um, or, or misinterpret in order to, to feel more certain. Because I think ambiguity is what gives rise to curiosity. So perhaps ambiguity, uh, being comfortable with ambiguity is the parent of curiosity. And if I suggested through my sequencing or other comments that those are, are conflicting states, um, that's, I'm, I'm glad someone pointed that out because I don't believe they are. You can't I think be curious without being puzzled. I think that's a great uh, response, and I, I would agree. I think it tends to be a kind of a dialectic. You move from one to the other, and then your new certainty becomes hopefully the basis for, for new ambiguity and new curiosity. Uh, I'm afraid, however, that is all the time we have for the Q&A, but, but thank you again, Jerry, for a great exposition of your thinking here. Uh, there is uh, more information in his recent book. Uh, I'm sure many people will want to check that out. Uh, I also want to, uh, again, remind you, we'll, we'll be sending a follow-up email with links to the slides that Jerry presented. Um, and if you have additional questions, you can reach him at gzaltman at hbs.edu. I'm sure he would love to hear from you. Um, and I want to remind the audience that since 1961, nonprofit MSI has brought together the best minds in marketing from major corporations and top business schools around the world to improve business practice by applying science to marketing's biggest challenges. So again, thanks to Jerry and thanks to the audience. Thank you for attending. And we hope to, that you will join us for our next lunch lecture at MSI webinar soon.